Welcome to Surfacing. In this episode, hosts Lisa Welchman and Andy Vitali speak to qualitative researcher and experienced strategist, Mina Kothandraman. The conversation mainly formed around understanding qualitative research and why it's so important to be inspired by and learn from people when designing products. Mina also shared advice for teams who face challenges and constraints around getting research integrated properly into their development process. Thanks for coming on Surfacing, Mina. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Andy. I'm really honored. And it's, it's just so nice to meet you, Lisa. I know I know Andy, but uh, we're going to have a rockin' time. <laughs> we are going to have a rockin' time. I mean, before we press record on this podcast, I mean, maybe we can just r- jump back in and f- finish this conversation that we started about Instapot versus Crockpot versus just Mm. let it sit on the stove. And you mentioned, this is relevant because you said that the inventors and makers of the Instapot are from from Ottawa. Ottawa. They are, they are. I was so proud of my peeps. And And it's a, I mean, it's a good device, except just sometimes I feel like if you know how to cook something with the right pots and pans and you know your stove, then don't mess with it. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone you, said, you know where, everyone you know said get an Instapot because they know I'm all about stocks and broths. And they're like, oh, you can do it twice as fast or three times. Okay. Or in a, you can do in an hour what it takes you like 12 hours on the stove to do. And so I did it and it just wasn't right. Like it just, like I would rather get up at 530 in the morning and put the pot on the stove. And I'm sorry, vegetarians, put the bones in the pot. And Mina, I know you are a vegetarian. And let, it, is, and let it go for 12 hours. And But do as you do. Do as you do. <laughs> yes, exactly. But anyhow. <laughs> I don't feel the need to update every process. Like sometimes it's just fun and you enjoy it for what it is. Well, that's an interesting thing that you just said. You don't enjoy, you don't think you have to update every process. So maybe we can apply that to actually sort of the design world. <laughs> oh, <laughs> What? What? <laughs> what? Did I say that about the design? World? No, you just said you just made a general statement. I'm sliding us sideways over into a more yes. design-centered conversation. Um, it, so let, let, we'll, we'll put that. Let's extend extended metaphor. Let's put that question on the back burner, mm-hmm. and let's go to how about you introduce yourself and tell tell everybody about you know what you do, what you're doing, who you are. So who I am, what I do. So I am a qualitative researcher. I've been a qualitative researcher for over 30 years, and I just love studying people. I've always found human behavior fascinating. I love meeting people. I love hearing their stories. Um, Some stories are very, very interesting. Some are just interesting. But there's always something that you sort of walk away with that I find um, can very much inform how you shape your own life. So being a researcher is really having a lot of fun and getting paid for it too. But I've been a qualitative researcher um, for a long time. I uh, have a micro agency in Boston, um, Twig and Fish. I'll let you decide on which one I am, the twig or the fish. But uh, I have a wonderful partner, Zara Ludin, who is fantastic. And the two of us get to work together in really focusing organizations on leveraging qualitative research as a strategic tool. So making sure that it's not not only the act of doing it, so you want to make sure that it is done properly, it's conducted properly, um, it's really bringing together everybody and rallying everybody around the human story. And so often we meet designers, and Andy, you know this so well, we talk, we've talked about this before, we meet designers who don't have any connection to the human story and simply are just going down that process meaninglessly. Like it's just, I'm doing what I'm doing and got the blinders on and I'm just charging forward. But if you don't have something that connects you to the person that is going to benefit from what it is that you're creating, I think there's always something missing there then. Not only for the person who receives the product, but also for the 
person creating. So for the consumers and the producers, basically. Um, so our focus is on really helping organizations think a little bit more deeply about qualitative research, not just as this haphazard process that you can jump in and jump out of and, hey, Andy, are you free? Because I got to ask you a few questions because we have to do some research. It's not equivalent to the ask of a question, which is how so many people feel like, what's the big deal? Anybody can ask a question. But I think especially in today's world, we have to sort of unravel people. Not everybody is present and top of mind on the topic that we seek to understand more about. So how do we allow and sort of invite people in like a guest into our home? How do we invite them in? You know, the moment somebody walks in your house, you don't, you know, barrage them with questions and what are you doing and how are you doing? What is going on? And it's not how you do that. You let them walk in, you let them settle in, you offer them a drink. You sort of let everybody settle down before you can get them to open up and tell you about what exciting events are going on in their life. That's the part that I love about conducting research is it feels like inviting a guest home. Nice. So, so Mina, can you explain for people who may not know what qualitative research is and how do we study people to learn how to design for them? Absolutely. So qualitative research basically is understanding human data at its most basic level. And human data, when we describe humans, we talk about behaviors, we talk about aptitudes, we talk about attitudes and emotions. And understanding those four areas and characteristics of how we are as humans, qualitative research tries to do that in a way that is very story-based. It produces a lot of thick and rich data. So we ask people not just a pointed yes, no answer, but you know, tell me about the story of the last time you took a trip and where was it? And it's unraveling a conversation so that people can really almost reveal some of those nuances that they take for granted in their own lives. The act of doing qualitative research offers a platform for people to really articulate those thoughts and to be able to sort of meander with you in a way where you can guide them down a path of ultimately what your learning objective is, but that they can share that human story that is so integral to understanding why and how you're doing what you're doing with your product. So qualitative research is that body of knowledge that generates that versus quantitative, which is a lot more about numbers, about how many times you do something. You know, it's all about different types of numbers. How much might you earn? What is your age? How many people do you have in your household? How many times do you click on a button? It's a lot of how many times. But the qualitative aspect is really the why, is it's most commonly described, is the why behind you're doing things. I mean, that's really interesting to me because when I talk to people about, you know, work on a digital governance project with people, I'm, I ask them a fundamental question, which is, do you know who in your organization is accountable for establishing your strategy and then the supporting policies and standards and other guidance that support execution of that strategy? And mm -hmm. around strategy, when I'm, when they say yes, I will, I'm like, well, show it to me. Right. And then I say, I want to, I'm looking for both a quantitative statement of your strategy and then a qualitative mm -hmm. statement of your mm -hmm. strategy. And everybody puts their arms around the quantitative success metrics, KPIs, whatever your organization oh, yeah. calls them, because they're not easy. I mean, getting a, a solid set of performance indicators in place is not an easy job, so I'm not belittling that at all. But what fascinate, mm -hmm. fascinates me about, and, and, and an organization can make qualitative statements, particularly around their brand, like the mouthfeel of their brand and how they want people to feel around their brand in particular. But when it comes to then transporting that qualitative aspect into the product development life cycle, right? Yeah. Beyond just saying, I, we want to be perceived as this as an organization, but actually bringing it in there. And, and I, I might be showing my ignorance, but if I'm ignorant of it, it probably means there are other people too. Like we're never, mm -hmm. we're never ignorant alone. That's what I've discovered. How do you make that translation? How do how do people use this information that you reveal? So you're, you're revealing mm -hmm. all this kind of soft, fluffy, sometimes just yeah. easy to blow away type of information around an experience. And, and how does that get translated into the product development lifecycle? 
Absolutely. There is, um, and I'd love to take you through this sometime, Lisa, just for your own personal yeah, yeah. knowledge. I mean, there's pro- a, there's maybe a, a lot of listeners know this if they're all designers or whatever, but a lot of listeners aren't designers and, and I'm not a designer. And so I know it's there, I see it, but it's almost like this magic that happens, right? So it'd be great. Absolutely. No, absolutely. There is a there is a framework that we have put together, both Zarla and I really, a little selfishly actually put it together in order to be able to help sort of what we call non-researchers um, really try to understand the different asks that people have around qualitative research. Um, and at the most basic level, with this framework, what we've been able to sort of get people to take a step back of is most often whatever you are trying to come out with when you're learning, um, you know, trying to learn from people, is you're either trying to be inspired by people or you're just trying to inform the product that you're that you're looking to create. It pretty much ends up in those two camps. A lot of times the inform the product starts to tend toward those quantitative kind of measures. Like um, I have three options, which one do you think goes well? Or if we did it this way, how do you feel about this? But it'll always be very pointed towards the product. It's much more about the human sort of connecting with the product. But when we look to be inspired by people, what I'm actually looking for are patterns, like much larger patterns that I can see in order to be able to go, oh, it's not just me asking, you know, again, if we pick on travel for some ridiculous reason that came into my head. But if I pick on Lisa and say, when was the last time you sort of planned something where you were traveling? Let's talk about that. You could start talking about that and I could laser, you know, sharp you into that world of travel. But instead, I want to sort of take a step back and ask you about planning, about the act of planning. And if I give you a chance to sort of dwell in that, and you can share different uh, ways see, that you plan. I see. It reveals, you start to you see start that. To re- it starts to reveal things that aren't necessarily on the critical click path or on the task paths, all of these sort of non-essentials. Yeah, okay, that's probably some of the, the, the time that it takes for for people who are doing product development, if they're doing it well, um, and maybe the not having time to consider these things that you're talking about leads to some of the not great outcomes. Well, a lot of times designers are pushed up, I mean, pushed up against the wall where they are, we've worked with some designers who have been put under ridiculous constraints of, you know, we have six weeks, you have to come up with three new products. And I'm just like, wow, why? And who does that? But they do. Um, And in those situations, to me, I feel really like it's very unfair to designers. Designers are brilliant at what they do, and they love solving problems. They love creating solution for people to cover up a gap and say, we took care of it. But when they don't, when they sort of just have to do this churn, where they're just going and and changing and, and sometimes getting these kind of directives of change that button to blue or change it to gray or what those kind of things where they're just sort of funneled down this this you know path that doesn't really allow them to explore they then start to lose some of that sense of inspiration and connection with what they're creating but it's also that if asked then to do something it's a skill right you have to sort of hone that skill you have to be able to look beyond and go oh my gosh you know these people are struggling with this there's a better way to do this and there's not enough inspiration, I find, that's being given to designers. And it's quite unfair because at times it, it doesn't allow them to sort of spread their wings and actually show how creative they can be. Um, but when you have them along with you, you're conducting qualitative research, somebody's telling, you know, speaking through a story and going through the details of a story. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of times that people who are with us, be they designers or product you know, managers or engineers, you just see their eyes and their brains like the mice are running at hyperspeed in their head because not that they you know, want to solve it right there, but they see solution like that's what their brilliance is. They're able to see it. But the story gives them that inspiration. And if they don't have that inspiration, I find it's actually quite unfair to them. And then they're supposed to produce brilliance. Well, they're probably then, it's just a task list, right? It's just like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Anyhow, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Yeah, you know, you you talk about that inspiration and it is important, you know, being on a design team, having a design team, when we get to see, especially with our 
cross-functional partners, those insights firsthand and learn those things, they're so valuable. It helps us get aligned on really the problem that we're solving and understanding the people that we're solving problems for. But sometimes it's not just that that lack of inspiration. It's what you call the age of, of immediacy, right? It's we have this, this desire to just churn and crank and move really fast. And, and we often hear, you know, well, we don't really need that much research. We, we understood enough about them or we have a subject matter expert that knows something. Let's just move past that right now. That's what we have is good enough. And for the teams that deal with that, like, what is, what, what would you tell them? Absolutely. I love that question. I'm just writing myself down notes because I'm, I sometimes meander with what I say and I don't want to lose track of the great question. So the way we handle that actually, and that's a really excellent point that you bring up because it happens more often than not is either there's a subject matter, matter expert or there's just, we know this, you know, why, why do we have to go and revisit this again? What is research really going to offer us any type of research for that matter? And where we always start any of our discussions is with understanding knowledge, knowledge sources, and confidence in that knowledge and confidence in the knowledge source. And the reason we always start there is because at times there are, there is, there is, there are teams that actually will look at what they know and go, oh yeah, yeah, we know this, we know this. But the question is, is to actually ask everybody on the team, how they feel about something. Do you know this? Do you feel good about this knowledge? Where did it come from? Um, what was the source? What were you trying to answer? And then what is your confidence in it? The thing about confidence is it's binary. It's either high or low. You can't have medium confidence because that really means you have low confidence. So we sort of approach it from that point of view where if people sort of are pushing the research aside, Go through a knowledge confidence exercise because if there's even one or two people in the room who are just like, yeah, but why are we doing it this way? Or God forbid it's the newbie who has joined, which I always love when the newbie's like, yeah, I'm really new to this, but I don't really understand why you're doing it this way. Those are the people I love actually because they start to challenge whatever our assumptions are. How much of that knowledge is based on assumption how much of that knowledge is based on high confidence? And if everybody is high confidence, rock on. Like everybody go to town, do what you have to do. Research does not need to be done gratuitously because it just sounds grand that you did it. It really needs to be employed where it's needed. But if even a few people are medium confidence, feeling meh, then it behooves us to ask ourselves, how do we reach that sense of high confidence and what must we do and what are our knowledge sources? Is it enough to go to a subject matter, matter expert internally and ask them, do we feel that they really know what's going on? Well, they're not really in, you know, they're not actually a nurse that's practicing now. They're just a nurse practitioner that's on our board. But do they really know what's going on? Are they actually going and dealing with COVID in hospitals now? It's not quite the same. They've done like trauma work, but this is a different level of trauma. So can they be that proxy? If we start to feel eh about it, then that's a very good sign that you actually do need to go out and get some more qualitative data. Right. That goes back to the you are not the user, right? You know, you, you may have experienced that at some point, but you're you're not going through it now. And, and your experiences are still going to be different than other people. And it really does take hearing a lot of perspectives to understand the problem in depth. And co context is changing. You both know so well how fast context is changing. Context is changing so rapidly on us that we have to somehow keep up with that, but in a way that we feel confidence at every step. So I was talking about when we study people, we look at those behaviors and aptitudes, we look at attitudes and emotions. Behaviors and aptitudes, if we look at that data, that data changes constantly. We're, we're picking up new behaviors. We're learning new things on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't even realize that. And yet so much of our designs are based very behaviorally. But we don't realize then that if we focus on that, then we actually realize our designs have to sort of change to keep up with people. When we're looking at attitudinal and emotional data, it changes things up because they're longer lasting. If you think about your attitude towards certain things or your emotion with or on certain things, you'll realize actually that they've stayed with you a long time. They're harder to change. They're not as fleeting. 
So it's important for us to then, it just, you keep on sort of stepping down. It's confidence, it's understanding that data, it's what kind of data you're going after. You know, it's sort of, you have to sort of uncover all of that in order for the team to have transparency into what are we actually trying to answer? And is it just something we can whiff off the top or do we have to dig a little bit deeper? And that's the exercise that we go through even before thinking about what method and, you know, all this stuff. People love to start with method. Like there's several books out there. I will say this on air. Several books out there that when you open the book, it's all about how to ask the right question. It's not the ask of asking the right question first. First, you have to sort of establish the parameters of why you're even doing this research in the first place and making sure we sort of set that up first. You know, this is really interesting. I want to back one step back a little bit because sure. one of the things that's hanging, sticking with me that you mentioned is um, the newbie in the room who's saying, I don't know why we do it this in the first place. And I'm, I'm laughing to myself because I'm often that person who's like, why, are we, why is it like this kind of person? Oops, mm-hmm. Sorry, my phone beeped. Um, I think it's interesting because I'm wondering whether or not there's anything that you do that helps solve the problem of a lack of inclusion in the room when that is being addressed. So everyone in the room, you're saying if there's a high level of confidence, that's really, that's great. We can proceed. Maybe we don't need to do this. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure when we think about a lot of the sort of online disasters, I won't list any, but everyone fill in the blank with whatever online social media company or whatever you think is the disaster of the day, that those people in the room had a high level of confidence to do, but the challenge for them was that the room was not particularly inclusive, right, when they're making mm-hmm, decisions. Right. And so Absolutely. that may not be in your world. You may be taking your sort of research marching orders from a client or from someone for a particular product. Mm -hmm. But is there anything in that space where you get to help address that aspect? And and how would that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. So even when we are taking our marching orders from all sorts of people, so we work with like marketing, engineering, um, C-level, C-suite people, it just is all over the map, research teams sometimes. So when we get our marching orders, The one thing, and I don't know whether this is an artifact of having done this for long enough now, but if somebody is going to invite us in and ask us for our expertise, then I actually want to give them my expertise. I want them to hear both what I have to say, what Zarla has to say. We have to share earnestly and honestly and transparently what we're seeing. Sometimes it might go over well, and sometimes it might not. But I feel it's almost insincere of me to not say, you know, hey, so we have to hear from everybody. Oh, well, not sure when I want to invite this person because they're sort of problematic. They always sort of ruffle people's feathers. That's great. I like the problematic people. Please invite them in. I'm not scared of them. I'm not worried that they're going to step on anybody's toes. That's for us to manage. But sometimes we have to get behind that. Maybe they haven't been heard enough. Maybe there's frustration. We don't know. So sometimes it's really important when we are having this align phase that we call, we have a five phase process and our first phase is aligning. We always ask that there is inclusion from the people that have to be at the table. And it's not enough for people to just come and, you know, some people will be chewing their pen and just sort of rocking back and forth, not really saying much. Not saying much doesn't mean they're not engaged, but we do make sure that there is activity from everybody like everybody has to get up and do something with us and often the the best compliment we've gotten quite honestly is that the session was therapeutic which makes me smile but people feel like they've had a chance to get things out of their head partly because they ever, barely ever get a chance to reflect on their own work they're always moving from one meeting to the next and it's just go 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 and they don't even get a chance to look at their own work but it gives them a chance to sort of dwell in that moment, see what's going on, hear what other people are saying, and actually gain some clarity to the point where they can be, you know, have some contribution. So it's a bit of them being able to contribute and us wanting them to be a part of things. 
from all aspects. Yeah, that I, 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 I may be asked my question poorly, so I get that. No, no, oh, no, I'm no, so sorry. I get that. no. I, you answered a question that I asked. I guess I'm asking in particular, is it in your domain to ensure that the user research being done is broad enough do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I mean, yes, so it's right, where you're it's, going. It's yes, broad yes. enough. I mean, I, I can't, an episode can't go by where I don't say algorithmic bias. I think that'll be a theme, Andy. Every episode, Lisa will say algorithmic bias because it just gets me upset. But that's, I think, just a really good example of we know research had to happen <laughs> in order yeah. for these, these, these products to be developed. And some really big things got missed on that front. And yes. often do, we yes. had a, a, a conversation um, with Regine Gilbert um, on accessibility. And there's another example of things that aren't happening high, you know, high up, upstream in the uh, product development process in terms of inclusion. And so I'm wondering, is there an aspect of the work that you do that advises or helps organizations yeah. do a better job at that? Because I think it would be Absolutely. invaluable for folks, particularly when you have a fairly homogenous product development team that could very well be nodding their head and going, yeah, we all, looks good to me, yes. right kind of thing, when in reality, it looks good to them because, you know, they told you to talk to three people that look like them. So, and they said it looked good to them too. So I'm wondering, is there anything in your process where you address that? Absolutely. So I'm so sorry. I was talking sort of at that first step of internal, but yes, once we decide on, what the learning objective is, and we sort of air quotes get our marching orders, if that's fair to say, and what's the scope of study that we're going after, there is a big part of recruiting participants, understanding who we seek to learn from. And in doing so, yes, a lot of times people go with that convenience sample. Oh, we'll just go with these five people that we've always gone with, or we'll go with these 20 people because um, they're on our voice of customer board. That's something that we bring a lot of detail to. And I don't know if there are um, links that you can attach to the podcast. Yeah, we've got show notes, so throw them out there. Yeah, fantastic. I will send you an article that we actually wrote just as important as it was for Black Lives Matter and just talking down that path of what is the responsibility of researchers as we try to support this movement, as we try to raise awareness really important for us to consider who we're recruiting because some of it is has already been baked in as you rightly said not only is it that the people creating are all homogenous but the people we go and learn from are also homogenous so it just sort of keeps the cycle of homogeneity going at a point where we have to ask ourselves wait a minute is this the right way to do things so when we are actually doing our participant recruitment there is heavy detail in terms of not just, you know, behaviors, aptitudes, but psychographics, demographics, really looking at it and scrutinizing all four, where demographics, unfortunately, seems to always sort of fall to the, are they this age? It's important for us to capture this age group, um, or they need to be from this geographic region. But when it comes to race, and when it comes to that discussion around a balance of race, even though we all say, and we need a balance of race and ethnicity, it often tends to skew one way. Now, you go back in that process of looking to your recruiter and you look at their lists and their lists are also, I'm going to use the word tainted for lack of a better, it's just like, sort of work it backwards. You notice that the lists are also quite homogenous in nature. So it's on us to push a little bit harder to not just say, oh, well, you know, hey, we filled the recruit, woohoo fantastic, but to scrutinize and to look to those details and say, are we really getting a balance of this here? When I was talking earlier about the two sides of our our framework where we have, you know, inspire and sort of learn from people, especially on that side, we find it's incredibly important to make sure that that diversity is there, that true balance is there, because We have to appreciate that when we are being inspired by people, people from different backgrounds, even though we might come out of our house and do things a certain way that seems fairly fluid and the same, there's there's culture, there's details that we bring from our houses with us. 
that we don't really overtly recognize. And we need to learn from those people because often they have different ways of and doing solutions things that to could problems. actually yeah. really, <laughs> yes, could really get us cranked in a particular direction that's brilliant, that nobody would have paid attention to before because it wasn't the accepted way. And so it's so much fun to be able to push for that, but to also emphasize the importance of what you're getting back, which is that variety in thought. And race itself is interesting. Race and, and diversity is interesting as a topic just because, you know, then you ask, well, are you, are you Asian? Are you African American? You can ask these. And then you have people who are mixes who really don't know where they fall. So the question is, is there enough representation across the board? And that is on us. That is our researcher responsibility to make sure we don't just shove whoever we get under the table, that we really make sure we're thoughtful about the people we bring and that we learn from. There are times you go after particular people, but other times you really, really want to be as open as possible. How have organizations been that give you this homogenous list? You know, the last time we talked, we talked about um, how organizations shifted from, their focus has gone away from humans and more about just creating products and delivering. It may have been, I think, the bring your humanity to work talk that I saw. So taking this organization that's so focused on outcome and not the people involved and then going to them and saying, you know what, like we need to really be human focused, but then taking it the step further to like, we really need people from diverse backgrounds to get true insights. Have they been open to that? Or are they like, here's the list? Like, it, is it a battle every time or... How has that changed? I think, and so that's sort of a double-edged question for me to answer personally, because I feel like we choose our relationships very carefully. So it could be a bit of, it could, could be a bit of the people that we like to listen to and hear from and interact with and collaborate with because they have that open mind. But whenever we are faced with people who don't feel like they want to go that road or sort of feel shut down, we will attempt to try to get them to understand, to open up. But if they push in a direction that we're not comfortable in, quite honestly, Andy, we say we're not the right people to work with them. Because the goal is not to sort of be the ramming rod. I, do, I don't think at this point in my career I want to do that. I really love working with people who are so eager to cast the net wider. And so we, we tend to work with those people more so. So I don't know if that's a fair answer to your question, but when we do find we either bring it up to people, most people I will say, and especially in the last year to two years, I find that people's ears are much more open and attuned to the importance of this. But when people sort of shut us down, I find we walk away from it because it's it's a hard it's a hard discussion to try and suddenly have them you know, convince, and you know, you know, you've been on the, the consulting end as well, where if you start on that foot and you're sort of at odds with each other right at the bat, then it's, it's hard to continue and sort of really be collegial, collaborative, whatever the right word is to move forward. One of the things that I find interesting in consulting and, and that I find myself repeating a lot is that, you know, we all have a methodology or a pr approach or the thing that we believe in, the way we think it's right. I, I've got my digital governance framework methodology and I'm, you know, hell bent on saying that is the right way to do it. And, and I'm always open to conversation, but that's the way that I do work and solve problems. And, you know, one of the things I always think when I talk to a prospective client the first time is, you know, are they getting it? Are we in tune with things um, or are they being forced to do this work? Right. You know, a lot of times mm. people in the UN space might say we got an audit and it, we did an audit and we found out that, you know, we're not doing X, Y and Z and we need to govern our digital spaces better. So we're calling you. Right. But but culturally, they're not actually interested in doing the work. In, and so I hear a little bit of that flavor. And, and, and I've learned that it's just better to step away. Right. And not take on that take on that work, because if people really aren't primed for it. And I think the work that you do is even more like that. Um, Th where it's just sort of like if they're not interested in, in looking at things through an inclusive lens, um, it's going to be hard to convince them to do that. If it's just to check a box. Yeah, exactly. I mean, not 
not to belittle what you're saying, like not to sort of reduce it down to that, but, but there are a lot of people who want to just check the box. And there is so much that we have to learn sometimes. And especially when you look at a product, you see that it's struggling and you realize that it's lost its connection with people and that you see other products that are comparable or maybe analogous in an analogous space that are making that, that effort and you see that they're connecting with people. You know, when people have a wonderful relationship, they can't shut up about it. They, they keep on talking about it. It's just so wonderful that this happened to me. These people took care of me. It's almost a surprise yeah, right. when that happens. You're right. it's, which, it's, so you're like, what? That worked? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. why? With the millions of products that we have out there and the services and the, the, all the things that we're talking about, my, my favorite question to ask in a lot of conferences when I speak is, I'm giving you like three minutes on the clock. I want you to come up with five products or services that just blow your mind away. That just are like, wow, the average number that people get to, Two. what do you think it is? <laughs> Two. Oh. Two. Two is like, oh my God. Like I go five, anybody five? And there might just be one person. They're just doing this in the background. I'm just like, okay, no, that doesn't count. This doesn't count, right? But, but. It's barely two of all, think about from morning to evening, how many products and services you guys touch. And you're only really satisfied and excited about do. It's really sad. We can do better. Yeah, no, that, that, that is sad. And although I tried to think of how many, and uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's there's, hard. there's a couple well, close well, just by. Just in this but. conversation, we've, we've, been talking about, uh, maybe this is before we hit the record button, but I think the m bulk of the conversation was about products that we're, we don't like. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Exactly. So, so Mina, a lot of what you do um, was face-to-face. -face. It was, it was in person, it was having conversations and, and then the pandemic came and that went away. But when we last talked last week, um, you mentioned that you were about to do in-person research for yeah, the first time right. since when? I, a, a year ago. A year ago. A year and two months almost, actually. Yes. Nice. So how was that? Well, uh, you're catching me literally that tomorrow morning. I okay. had for my pilot. So we're going to see how it goes. But I'm very excited. I'm very excited. It's a really, it's a very fun space to be in. It's um, shopping. So it's um, grocery shopping. Um, and it's just very fun to see where this goes. But um, I think it's going to be interesting just because it's sort of that re-entry. I wonder what it's going to feel like. Uh, we've, we're taking all the precautions. We know our participants will be taking all the precautions. The team is going to be taking all the precautions. And it's quite a big space that we're in. But I have to say it's going to be really exciting. I, I miss it. I miss you know, learning from people face to face, because it's funny, you can connect with people. Sometimes there's an energy that you feel like person to person, face to face, that's a little different than remote. A lot different. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting because you won't, I mean, maybe you will, but maybe you won't see people's whole faces. So that's going to add another dynamic to seeing how they react and what that looks like. I was laughing, though, because I told Zarl, I'm like, man, I got to put on some other thing than pajama pants. Like, this is not good. So... <laughs> Gonna have to find one I fit into. <laughs> I was laughing about that. She's like, "Oh, good question. <laughs> what are we gonna wear?" <laughs> so, but yeah, it, I think it's gonna be really exciting. It's gonna be very exciting, and just being able to be with people and see what people are doing. And things have changed. Things will not be exactly the same, but um, but it, that's half the fun. Is in, in this field, we've we've been through, you know, changes. We've been through moments where. Um, People have injured, you know, very traumatic situations. We work on so many different types of projects. Right, right now alone, we're we're doing this grocery shopping discussion. We have a discussion on pets for something else. We have a discussion on um, military personnel going into the battlefield and what do medics do um, if there are medics that are actually going into the battlefield to take care of wounded soldiers. Um, we are talking with the city of Boston on developing anti-racism language into their processes. So it, it's just so different and each one is just so fascinating. So 
Well, what, really I mean, one of the questions that keeps repeating on me is, how did you get into this line of work? Right. So <laughs> that's a really, you know, there might be people out there listening who are like, oh, that sounds really cool. I want to do that when I grow up. Um, what was your, what path did you take and, and what recommendations would you have around that? I think the path is much easier. So I just want to say that now in advance, if anybody's listening, it's so much easier. There's so many great programs. Um, I didn't mention in the beginning, I'm also uh, a graduate lecturer at Bentley University, and I've been there for over 20 years. And we have an awesome, awesome program. I'm adjunct, so I can tell you I, I teach in other places, but I really do love the program here. And that's why I've stayed with them for so, so long. Um, but my path personally, I actually was an undergraduate in computer science. Um, really terrible. But you can coder. code, I just want can't to say you? That on but recording, can code, I can code. I can code. But um, I was one of the earlier cohorts for um, co-op for a co-op program in Ottawa, where I went to the University of Ottawa. And one of my first work terms, I was at a then company called System House. It was a very very big. Um, consulting firm, that and Anderson Consulting were the sort of two big consulting firms in Canada. And this was when, you know, we were just embarking on like, um, you know, getting applications onto computers and stuff like that. And my first project that I was assigned to was for Bell Canada to redesign the payphone. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and there was one, oh my God, it was, it was so fun. Um, but there was one woman, um, her name was Vanda McClelland, um, and she was a human factors engineer. And she was there, she was doing her stuff, basically basic ethnography, found it fascinating, learned a ton from her. And she sort of got me into this path of, you know, this is just really interesting. And I've been so fortunate. I got to do my graduate work at Syracuse. They had a special program at what is now called the iSchool, but it was the information school before. Um, and they had a program in this as a graduate program. So I went to Syracuse and then I just started working at different organizations because people were eager to get into this. And, you know, yep. everything yeah. was all about usability yeah. testing. Yeah. But now this, the sad thing is usability testing has its own woes where everybody wants to stuff everything into usability testing, which has also got its problems. But it was just from there, it was uh, moving around the world, living in a lot of different countries learning about different cultures, how different people view different problems, how they describe different problems. And it's just been a fantastic ride. I'm, I'm really fortunate. You, you made me think two different things. One really <laughs> about pay phones. I, I think, you know, I, I travel with my dad to go see um, football games. He's a Rams fan. So we usually travel somewhere to an away game or to L.A., and every time he encounters a payphone, he takes a photo with it. And I'm always like, that's strange to me. But I guess there's, I never asked him why. Like, I just think he thinks it's funny. But like, I have a payphone memory too. I, when I was younger, I used to go to the arcade with a friend. We were in like eighth grade and we used to spend all of our quarters playing this wrestling game. And we would have to walk home like miles, right? But one day it was just pouring. It was like wet, like snow, half snow, half rain. And we get to this payphone and like we used all of our quarters to play the game. So we had yeah. to make a collect call on the payphone to see who would come and pick us up. I, I don't know why I'm talking so much about reminiscing about payphones, but I'm curious, like what, what were some of the findings about those payphones? Because people might not even know what they are anymore. I know. I know. Do you know, I actually can answer that because I remember it so well, was we were observing. So you remember the older payphones used to have those really um, hard to press brown buttons. Do you remember that they were sort of almost, uh, if you look at the cross section of it, it looked like a triangle and you had to really go. Tick, tick, yes. And really push I remember that. Down I remember on. that. Well, that was that was the old payphone. So people often were misdialing. Um, like you, we would basically be eavesdropping is what we were doing and milling around people with their payphones and basically would hear them. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's wrong number. And then they have to pull out another whatever it was, put it in, you know, do it again. Um, and then it was fun to see how people uh, were were jimmying the system. So I, I don't say, know. That's probably what Andy did to get his ride home. I, he's like not saying that he stuck, he, he stuck yeah, a wire well, down, the, down, call. The, down the phone. <laughs> or we would do things like, okay, once you get to your friend's house, dial right. us yeah, and let yeah, it ring for yeah, three yeah, times yeah, and then yeah, hang yeah. up. <laughs> and I remember doing that. So we noticed that people were doing that. They're like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. So it became apparent that 
a bit of loss of money there too going on. So they actually built it in a, a better phone, much more beautiful keys. I'd like to just like, you know, brush my shoulders a little bit and say, it's still the same design in 2020. I can't remember the last time I saw a pay phone. I, 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 I often- This is a beautiful pay phone. But I, I believe you. I believe you. We'll have to get a picture of this beautiful pay phone and put it in the show notes so that people can see this beautiful pay phone. But, <laughs> but the, the keys, and then it had a screen and you would see the number. And then once you commit, Committed to the number you've committed, and you get you get charged. So I'm sure the public didn't like that as much, but that was their way of and yeah, it was it was so much fun. But basically studying people and seeing how people were sort of literally using and abusing <laughs> the phones was fantastic. You know the the other that's that's funny still, but the the other thing that you mentioned that I I don't want to walk away from is uh, how people are cramming so many things into usability testing now. And I just wanted to, to hear a little bit more about that or go a little bit deeper on that because I, you know, we've got a, a research team that we're evolving where I work and, you know, it's, it is, it's like, how do they get caught up? Like what is considered usability testing? Like how, how much stuff is being crammed in there is what I'm asking. And like, how do we stop that? That is, that's precisely why we put that two by two framework together. So I'm, again, I'm happy to send you the link on that article as well. But the rationale for that is the amount of times people would call us and say, hi, so we need you to come and run a usability test. And here are the five people you have to talk to. And right. without even telling us what they're trying to Just execute on solve this. for. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So be like, okay, well, let's talk about first what you're trying to learn, sort of back them up a little bit. And often what we found was, is that they, you know, they basically want to sell their bottle. They have their bottle that they're selling. And after putting it in front of somebody, I'm going to look at Lisa and say, Lisa, this is a bottle. But before we talk about this bottle, can you tell me how you drink water at home? And suddenly we're taking the person to a different place. We're talking about their context. We're talking about, that's actually just really biasing and it's not the right way to get that data. So that's where the research team has to say, no, it's not the right way to get. In fact, we're actually getting bad data by doing it this way. What we really need to do is go to that person's home if we're talking about water and have them like show us where, you know, where they drink water, right? And take a diary study of them doing a log of drinking water and where all do they drink water and what do they drink it in? There is a different way to capture that context, but often because they think it's, they're doing research, they're, you know, air quotes around that research word, they literally shove everything into testing. So what we did, Andy, was we, that's why we came up with this framework where it literally takes the question that people are asking and teases it down to the point of really exploring. Are you trying to learn about somebody's context, somebody's world? Are you just trying to validate the product? Because the question should be a yes, no answer then. Does this cap screw on easily? Yes, no, great. That's your usability test. That's as, that's as direct as it should be. And what we were able to do is we put this two by two together. It became a visual canvas where when people look at it then and they start to see that their questions have visual distance, they actually got the fact that they couldn't be shoved into one study. And sometimes people will still ask, so can we do this all in one study? No, because the study design dictates if you want to get, again, high confidence data, this is where the confidence discussion comes back, you really want to learn from people this way so that they can articulate all of that detail about drinking water and more. So it was really to have the stakeholders, whoever's asking, sponsors, whatever we want to call them, whoever's asking the questions, to really tease apart the questions before we even think about method. And the good thing is, is that where we've worked, we have our approach, we have a five-phased approach that we, we use in everything that we do, and we've literally left it behind so that they can keep using it. And now it's become a language. Now it's become transparent to people of, oh, now we have like critical mass of questions. Let's get the people together. Let's have them replot the questions and we can see where the grouping of questions are. It also tells you a lot about the organization, what kinds of questions they're asking. If you're always asking validation questions, then how is the company growing? How is the design team able to grow beyond that? So there's a lot of meta level data. This framework has helped us in tremendously. We sort of call it the gift that keeps on giving, but literally that has been our focus. So 
that is the way to avoid everything ending up in a usability test. All of this is just making me very sad in a way because I'm realizing I'm around teams that make, you know, digital products all the time. And I know that I'm, and I talk to designers all the time and I talk to developers. I talk to everybody on the team, the people who are funding the products and, and, you know, because it's governance, the compliance department, legal, IT, everyone's in the mix. And they talk about a lot of things, but they never talk about this. When I ask them about how they work Mm. and what do you need to get your work done and how do you make good products and services or ask them about service design, this part never really comes to the front as an aspect of what they do. It's always a very, very strong execution path of like, oh, we've identified a need in the market, we've built a tool and we've deployed it. And I know the built a tool, that's a big, that's a big container. And I understand a lot of stuff goes in that container, but I hear about a lot of the things in that container in a lot of granularity from developers and a lot of granularity around data handling and a lot of granularity around content strategy on a lot of granularity around visual design, right? I I hear all of that, but I don't hear this. So do you think that's because I'm just not hearing it or do you think compared to those other things, this is really de-emphasized in the process, particularly in an agile environment? Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't believe you can do qualitative research with agile and I'll debunk that myth and say it's absolutely possible. It just means we have to plan and plan better. And again, that two by two helps us to plan. So that's the other reason why we love it because the result of that two by two is a roadmap of all of your study scopes. So if you have knowledge of what you have to ask, then it's just a matter of planning it out with whatever sprints you have and you should be able to align it. So if your design team needs to hit the ground running on June 1st, your research needs to inform them by May 31st. Makes sense, right? So it just means you have to be able to plan better. And we do, I will say, we're, I'm a bit hard-nosed about this. So if somebody keeps on calling us and says, oh, I only have two weeks, oops, or I just you know, can't, can't fit it in this budget, We will help them through it once, but then once we've gone through the motions of doing that planning, and if they keep on calling us back with this kind of oops situation, that means you're a bad planner. I don't want to take that burden on myself. But doesn't this also mean that people just have to, and Andy and I talk about this a lot, people just have to realize that to a certain extent, they just have to work more slowly. Yeah. Oh my God! And how? I mean, like, I mean, like, it's it's not about like stay up long, stay up longer, and and you know, sleep less so that you can do research. It really is. It just takes longer to build good product. And what's wrong with that, right? I mean, I, I mean, not everything is an emergency. The one of the, the stories that I, I like to tell a lot is, you know, people will call me up and say, "Hey, Lisa." we're getting ready to do a CMS replatform. And as a result of that, we realize we have no idea who's on the team or what they do or who makes decisions. Can you come in and do a governance project for us to help us understand that? Because basically, if you don't know those things, you can't really design that system that encompasses the entire team. And I'm like, sure, it's going to take some time. Well, we don't have any time. Right. We don't don't have any time because this this thing's got to be stood up in like 18 months. Then fast forward like three years later, and, and usually when they say that, I'm like, well, I can't help you because the work that I do takes time, right? Do the best you can, you know. Three years later, they call me and they go, hey, Lisa, you know, and I'm like, well, how did that CMS replatform go? Oh, we never got it done, right? And so it's just, I mean, the number of times that story has happened because the reality is you can't do a good job on something. And, and I would imagine with product design, if you deploy something that's not good, you're not actually winning. You're just going to have to go jerry-rig it later on or retrofit it or turn it into the Borg by potting stuff on it. Or worst case scenario, it's so bad, you have to gut the thing and start all over again and do it right in the first place. And so I I, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if I don't- I'm smiling with you. I just, you know, but that seems like a not good thing to say in the product development community because you almost get just pushed out of the room by default by saying, can you just slow down? I mean, they almost look at you like you're like a nut or something because you, you, you're you saying, just take your time a little yeah. bit and build something better. Yeah, 
I have so I have so many things. <laughs> You're saying that, and there's like things popping out of my head. The first thing I'll say is yes, absolutely yes. I'm trying not to swear, but yes, 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 because it's it, it's imperative for us to appreciate that some things just take time. The the sort of the research world response of that that we get all the time is, well, you finished collecting the data, so can you give us the report tomorrow? And you sit there and you're like, no, actually, we have to take the whole team through this. We're going to story tell. We're going to dwell in the data. Let's soak in it a little bit and see where this data takes us. It's like I always use the metaphor of climbing a tree. Like you go up a branch and, you know, you probably climb trees as kids. Like I used to do it all the time. And you, you go up a branch and you get on that first branch and you're like, yeah. And then you go halfway up and you're like, oh, no, I can't go anywhere with this branch. And you come back down and then you go to a different branch that you think didn't look so solid in the beginning. But, oh, my God, it just opens up like a ton of, you know, a plethora of opportunities. And you know you can climb that up and it's getting to the top of the tree. But actually, the act of going up and down every branch is what the team needs to be there for. That's when the magic actually happens because everybody's talking the story and then suddenly they're like, oh my God, you know what? This actually connects here. We can do this, this, that, that. And the next thing you know, everybody's brains are just exploding. They're exhausted by the end of the day, but in a really happy kind of, you know, when your muscles sore and you work out and you're just like, oh, my muscles are sore, but it's a good feeling. It's that kind of feeling that we love, but it takes a little bit of time. So that is time we won't back down on. The other thing that I would say that is really important to us is that whenever we have people who approach us with a study, we do the two by two exercise without fail. And it's not something you have to do all the time, but with clients like the first time, just to get that roadmap out, we do it. And then once we do it, if they select a study scope, we always present the ideal approach, the ideal timeline. And this is not to say that I'm going to take a year because I think I have it, but reasonably, what is an ideal timeline? What's the ideal approach? How many participants? What kind of methods? And when they go, oh, no, we need it in half the time, then we'll say, okay, we can cut this back and you can do it iteratively, but this is what you're going to lose. And that's the part that we forget as researchers. We don't tell them what they're going to lose. So they think it's all awesome, but they're going to lose something because you cannot take 40 hours of work and make it 20 hours of work magically. It just doesn't happen that way. So having that discussion is super important and making sure that sponsors understand that right up front, even before anything has gone too far down the path, but we're wasting a dime is to make sure that that is there. And often, to be honest with you, because researchers haven't done a good job of communicating that to people, they don't know. So now that they know, the next time they call us, they're like, well, now I actually have the six weeks you need. So it's sort of almost turned the tables a little bit on expectations. Sometimes it's a bit of a hard swallow, but then they know they can plan for it. And budget. So right. both of them help. You know, you, you mentioned two things that, that I thought immediately, you know, the tree analogy of, of going through things together, learning, trying something, going back another way, like making a mistake, failing, picking it up and, and iterating, right? Iterating was the other thing you said. There's not a lot of iteration. There's talk of iteration. There's, we're going to go ahead and we're going to like launch this thing. It's going to be our MVP, which is a shitty term. And then, and then we're going to go back and we're going to learn and we're going to fix it. And then when it's time to do that, it's like, wait, we can release 10 more features instead. And th- so, so there's that pain that teams experience. But then there's the actual thing of like, as a team, when you're off running in separate directions and it's very chaotic and you're not taking the time to really do things right. And and you could get from point A to point B just in the same amount of time going like aligned and going through shit together, which teams have to do to grow as you can going in 50 different directions. Because that that is just what I see as one of the biggest pain points is there's no alignment and then there's also no prioritization. Yeah. It's, it's so the other point that I'm going to bring to, together to what you just said, Andy, and also Lisa, what you'd said earlier, is that we did a fun study last year, um, and we have to further it. We just sort of had slowed down because other things sort of took over. And that was actually my presentation at Flexible last year was about the study. And basically, it was about the cost of not doing qualitative research. Because everybody's always talking about the ROI of qualitative research. 
you hear about that all the time. But there, there is an actual cost for not doing it. And to summarize really quickly, the cost of not doing it actually re- results in people sometimes either coasting or caving in and just like quitting because they just are not being, you know, enthused or excited or, or you know, inspired by what they're actually creating because it's sort of this, we're just going to do the MVP path. And what we found is, is that if you actually conduct qualitative research and if there is that sense of emotional connection and relationship that you're building and that as a team you have this moment of analysis and also even that moment of going and observing people real time and seeing your product in use sometimes is really thrilling to some people. When you have that on board, we came up with a term called the happiness dividend. And the happiness dividend starts to go up. People are happier. They come back from, from studying, you know, what, listening to people or learning from people, coming back with just ideas popping out of their head. And we found that that is very important to recognize. Who is measuring the happiness of people at an organization? Because then we took it a step further and we said, if somebody leaves, what's the average cost of a person leaving an organization that is costly to replace a designer on a team or a researcher, whoever we're replacing. It's costly to do that, especially if the market is tight in some places, you're flying in. There's all sorts of additional costs. It was really interesting. We started to add up the costs and it was fascinating to see you could easily just conduct some qualitative research and maybe make people a lot more excited about what they're doing. You know, it's so funny because just listening to both of you all talk, and in particular, when Andy just said the word team, and I, we've been saying team all day, all, all day long on this one, but you know, I'm wondering whether or not this cle- tree climbing component is the equivalent of what other teams, like say an athletic team, or you know, I'm a singer, a choir, or whatever, would call practice. And so I'm wondering, when do teams get to practice? And in practice, you're allowed to experiment. You're allowed to do things improvisationally. You're allowed to do what if. You're allowed to, I remember one choir I sang in, the choir director's whole thing was, you know, having the different sections sing the other section's part. Right? Right? So that you really... So you really Been got a sense, you that. know, and I was a soprano, so we often had the melody and it was really hard to sing tenor, yeah, right? Because tenor seldom has the melody. Seldom, yeah. And so, and just hearing those things, but it also gave me an appreciation for being a tenor and it gave the tenors an yeah. appreciation for always having to hold that melody out, which is also another responsibility. But I'm just thinking maybe design teams in particular um, and, and digital teams on the whole, and maybe just teams in general, in a for-profit organization don't get to do that. I mean, we playing and practice used to be like research and development or, you know, the innovation lab or all of mm-hmm. these other sorts of things, but in the natural product development life cycle, and I don't I don't hear about I hear about some, but not a lot of digitally focused innovation labs, right? Where we're actually trying not out enough. things. Usually people are like, we're trying to make this thing hot and live fast. Right. And so there isn't really any sense of play. And so as a result, then the consumer or the customer or the citizen or whatever who's participating in that experience ends up being, you know, uh, consuming a lot of people's practice material. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Stuff that really wasn't quite ready, wasn't quite ready for the main performance. Um, I don't know if that sounds valid or not, but do you think, do you think teams have that space to practice? I think we need it desperately because with practice comes reflection and there's no time to reflect on anything. You're just moving so fast. You don't get a chance to see. And it's not to sort of, not to diminish the value of like a team lunch or, you know, having a beer together after work. That's, that is important, but that needs to actually be non-work stuff. But there's no time to have play during work. And that has to happen too, because then you see the hidden strengths of some people as well. Like we, yeah. we've seen some people who we always 
as part of our work, we always, always have our clients there. It's really not an option. You have to listen in. You have to listen in if it's a remote or you have to come with us or you have to attend or whatever it is. You have to be there with us because firsthand is very powerful. But as you go through this, you see that some people have these amazing capacities. You're wondering, how long have you had this for and why were you not going to tell us? Like, Oh yeah, I've done, I was a journalist in my earlier life, so I can, I can, I'd love to actually, you know, do this with you guys if you don't mind. Yes, good, come. That's a good thing because your team is going to need more of you and they should know that you have this capability. But it's not entertained. It's not encouraged. Everything seems so contrived. Everything seems so, you know, hyper planned and has to fit into a perfect box. And sometimes that serendipity is sort of lost. And the fun goes away then. I don't know. It, you, it, some, sometimes just by chatting about nothing, you end up with so much. Yeah, you, you definitely need room for what I like to call <laughs> creative oxygen on teams Ooh, like this. Oh, I like so that, that term. <laughs> I, I didn't make it up, but it it's, like uh, the it's a term that I, <laughs> 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 nice. it's, it's just the time and the space. And, and you know, as, as a leader, I, I try to create that space or that time. I even block out time for myself that I do put on my calendar as reflection time at the end of the week so that I'm not like scrambling to wind down and prepare for what I have to do next week. But it, it's so important to provide teams that space to be able to like just be themselves and and experiment and learn and play and share and like that's that's how they just get re-energized but I also think Andy you are and I feel like I know you well enough to say this that you uh you are a great role model you're doing that and your team is seeing that you're doing that so it sort of gives them that quiet permission to do the same thing there's plenty of people who I don't think do that as well as you do. So I also set some bad, bad examples from time to time. Yeah, you know uh, what? You know, I'm, I'm always on working, doing, doing a lot more work than I should, but I don't expect that of my team. It's just, but I should set a better example in that way too. You know, it, but it, it's, and I think right now, especially with, we're finding definitely that this division of home and work and everything just blending in and people having to like work in their bedrooms and, basically just roll off of their chair and roll onto their bed and they're off to sleep. So they have no separation of space or anything. People are definitely, it's, it's a struggle. There's, it's not easy, but I think the fact of what you just said was so spot on. People need a chance to just breathe. And it's funny, like you go for a walk and why is it that you come back sometimes? My, one of my dearest, dearest mentors, he's in the same town as me in, in Boston. And I worked with him Oh God, very long ago now, 25, 26 years ago. Um, and he's like my dad. He's just absolutely adorable. His name's Hal Miller Jacobs. And we would get into these hideous fights. <laughs> I can't even begin to tell you like, like, no, you don't know what you're doing. That's not the right study design. Don't tell me what you're doing. I've been in this field longer and we'd like fight like an old couple. It's pathetic. Um, but literally he'd go running on the bike path. I would go rollerblading in the opposite direction because I just didn't want to see him for a while. And then we'd come back and we'd be like, Oh my God, there's a way to bring this all together. He'd be like, okay. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. I yelled at you. No problem. I'm sorry. I yelled at you. And then we just go back to being best buddies. So you, you sort of have to do that. You have to have space to just to, I like that creative oxygen. I'm all over it. Yeah. I mean, this has been such a great conversation and uh, you know, it, it won't, it's just reminding me what you're describing, and I think we brought this up in our our episode with uh, with with Mike Montero, mm. which is just you know, we old fogies in the web world, right? Reflecting on about what it was like in the early days. So you know, I started doing work with the web in the mid '90s, and so I think what was great about that time wasn't just that it was new and nobody knew what they were doing so you could make mistakes and make things up, but it wasn't very clearly tied to the revenue stream, right? So people were doing it and if they were doing it that early, it, there was really no expectation. I mean, I was at Cisco Systems, so it very quickly turned into e-commerce, right? But, but still, but even with that, just sort of like the website and all this other kind of stuff, I just remember the immense amount of time we spent speculating on how to do this. How might one 
build a 300,000 page website and management? How might one get multiple languages? How do you do the translation process? And it was just all whiteboarding and making stuff up and we would try it live. So it's not, I'm not pretending there was actually a usability lab there, but we try it live, but there just wasn't the weight of, of having the CEO turn to you and say, and here's the KPI mm. and you need to hit that sucker. Right. And so Maybe not for this podcast, but it feels like an interesting conversation, maybe sometime to pull that apart and understand how that how the monetization of the web just pushes the team in ways that are maybe counterproductive, like Absolutely. you were saying. I, you know, looking for the return on investment in the wrong place. I would love right? to talk that through. I'm with you yeah. all the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm with it's you all. just I think all of us are on the same page here. Yeah, it is. I think we're really at this inflection point right now. What are we like almost 30 years in? Almost 30 years into the commercial web where everybody's just kind of like, you know what? This is not working. We're missing out on some like some some of the connections, some of the people that we meet even now when we talk with them and then even if we're just with them for like 2 or 3 weeks, we all sort of leave like a family, which is really precious. Like I, I can't sort of stress that enough, like that feeling of, of, wow, I just, I made some really nice friends. Like there's really good people here and thank you so much for coming. And they're all excited that we did this study together, that we all bonded together, that we all had a chance to think out loud and they really love the process. And that is, it just honestly is worth its weight in gold. It's so invigorating. It's so inspiring. And then we see what these people are doing and they just do great things with it. And it's even more exciting then. So yes, I completely agree with you wholeheartedly. So Mina, we're, we're really getting close to the end. Unfortunately, <laughs> You've been I, you so know, patient. Thank you. we, we started to talk about, um, the, the crock pot and the instant pot. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to end this without talking about your cooking show. Uh, and it was something that I, I didn't know about you. It's, I'm surprised that I, it never came up. But uh, I, uh, as I was doing some research, I'm like, I want to hear about this cooking show a little bit. Oh, my God. I, yeah, I, I have to say I'm not doing it quite as much anymore. I, I changed it into a little bit more of a philanthropic approach, which I, I like. But the original cooking show was basically um, I've been vegetarian all my life. My parents are incredible cooks, just oh my god too good and my whole family is really into cooking but my my mom and dad my dad was definitely more traditional south indian cooking my mom all different types of um south indian and north indian cooking and i'm not sure how much of the diversity of indian cooking you've had but it is crazy diverse it's just nuts yeah. how different it goes you know state to state in india but then we come you know my parents emigrated to the us and then they ultimately emigrated to canada and I was born in Ottawa and I was sort of the brat who always wanted like the, you know, I'd come home and I'd look like mopey and my mom would be like, did you have a bad day at school? And I'm like, somebody was eating pizza. How come we don't eat pizza? And my poor mom would be like, okay, pizza, got to figure out what pizza is. And she figured out how to do it. Why? Because I was the brat. My sister and brother apparently are much older to me and they never got away with that kind of stuff, but clearly I did. But my mom would just learn. She started making tacos. She started making all sorts of lasagna, like all sorts of stuff. And it was amazing. She just didn't stop. And she was so adventurous in her own right for making Indian food of, you know, you have certain vegetables that you need, but you don't get them in Ottawa, Canada. So she'd find like a comparable vegetable and try it and it would taste really good. And she'd share her recipes. So she and my dad were just such big inspiration, but they kept us vegetarian because it was very important to them, you know, religiously to keep us vegetarian. But to be honest with you, I've never had meat in my life. So I don't really feel the need to go to it because my, the food that I've had has been incredible. And my dad was insistent that all of us learned how to cook, which was probably a big gift that he gave us. So we all are all myself and my two siblings are big into cooking. So it's just like cultivating that that fun of being able to eat vegetarian food and still be able to have a variety of dishes. So I had a friend who just was like, you know, why don't you just do a cooking show? And I'm like, oh, you know, who's going to do it? Who's going to watch? 
but I didn't want to make it. So I pulled people. I did my research and I pulled people. And of, of course, course. <laughs> and they didn't, they're like, don't put the word vegetarian in. Cause it sort of ticks people off. I'm like, okay. So I made it um, all about what more you can do with your vegetables. And I called the show come veg with me. <laughs> which is so corny if you think about it, but it worked. So so it was a ton of fun. I did that for a few seasons and then basically just um, turned it into, uh, there's another wonderful effort in town by these three women who teach young children how to cook. And they go into Boston and ask children um, at the Boston public schools, you know, they will teach you how to cook. So they do cooking stuff there. But then we work together and we got kids to bring whatever sort of a list of ingredients of things that they naturally have in their fridge to teach them how to make healthier food with what they have. And so that's what it's turned into now. But it was a lot of fun. This must mean, this must mean that you are the twig in the twig and fish. <gasps> no! <laughs> I got it wrong! <laughs> I had a 50 Andy, 50 what's chance. Your guess? <laughs> I, I, I knew. I knew what it I knew you were the fish. I'm the fish. I'm the fish. It's because we went with our names. It was so funny. Oh my God. The naming of our company. God help us. The names we came up with. And Zarla is, I always say she's so academic. She knows more about language than I ever do. And she'd say a word and I'd be like, I have to look up in the dictionary. I don't even know what it means. And then she started laughing. She's like, no. We tried all sorts of stuff. And then she's like, why don't we go with our names? So my name, actually, my full name is Meenakshi. And it means I shape like a fish. I'm named after a goddess in the south of India. Um, so so there's my, there is my goddess, um, my goddess trait. And um, Zarla's name, her full name is Zarlashta. And her name means, it's basically a metaphor for blonde hair. It means golden twig. So we were going to be, you guys went yeah. deep. So she, we were going to be fish and twig. And she was like, that's not a very good acronym. I'm like, okay, let's go with twig and fish. <laughs> <laughs> and to date, we've only lost one contract because the person said they didn't like our name. And well, I was like, oh, okay, I guess we're not working together. Sorry. So, so Mina, um, how can people get in touch with you, find you? What are your favorite things? ways that you like people to seek you oh, out? I, um, I love getting in touch with people, new people. So if anybody's interested, I am on Twitter. I'm a bit of a Twitter junkie, I have to say. Um, so I can share my handle with you. It's uh, Mina underscore KO. So you don't have to remember my whole last name. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. And if you ever have research questions or you're sort of challenged by something research wise or anything like that, um, feel free to just email me at Mina at twigandfish.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Oh my yeah, God. It was great to chat and catch up for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. This was such a fun conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy surfacing, please rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also consider supporting the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash surfacing podcast. If you have suggestions for guests or a topic you'd like to hear about on surfacing, please reach out via the contact form found at surfacingpodcast.com. 